Welcome and anchor down. JT and Zeke on West End are back for the basketball preview, episode Oops. seven. We have five new additions to this team, only losing one big part, James Siakam from last year. We're really excited about this coming basketball season. Yeah, dude, and I liked Siakam a lot. He had so much heart, but the fact is he wasn't the best player on the team, and I think these freshmen can easily replace him. Honestly, I think Samir Sayik could easily replace him on his own. This guy has so much heart. If you ever watch videos on him, he just he loves basketball. He loves practicing. And he's a guy that I can easily see leading the team in rebounds this year. Yeah, the dude's 6'8", 6'9". Siakam, although he was listed at 6'6", or 6'7", he was actually shorter than Fisher Davis, we've been told, which is really yeah. impressive how he played that position. But Samir comes in. The guy dropped 20 and 14 in high school against some pretty good competition. He's a guy, a pick-and-pop guy, can score around the basket, can knock down the open three. He's a guy to be excited about. Yeah, he could easily be our best freshman, in my opinion. He's someone that's been underrated, maybe because of his physique. It's not quite... The the same as DJ Baptiste's seeing that guy around campus he is just lean muscle six foot ten 235 not he's an ounce shredded. of fat Jerry yeah. Baptiste he's shredded 610 looks like a guy who could play at the next level he might be raw only picked up basketball a few years ago he actually played in the same league as Samir in high school which is interesting as well they might have seen each other before but Baptiste's a guy, maybe not this year. I think he'll definitely play. He'll definitely be a contributor on the defensive end, help out in rebounding. He's a guy who can definitely blossom into an NBA talent down the road. Yeah, he averaged 10 and 10 with three blocks in high school. So clearly not quite as impressive as Samir. But just on raw size, you've got to think that under Stallings, he could be the next big star, big man for Vandy. I mean, we've had Festus Azalee. We have Damian now. Even Cornette to some degree, even though he's a different type of player. Yeah, we just, we're becoming a factory for big men, and that's really cool. DJ could easily be the next one, and that's not to uh, undermine Samir, who I've already mentioned I'm extremely high on. I think he's just more of a small forward, power forward type. So he's not quite the center that we've been molding in Damien and what we did with Festus. A cool fun fact also is that Baptiste played on the same high school team as Julius Randle. And Samir played on the same AAU team as him. So I know Samir was on the same AAU team, I think six seasons. So he's defending one of the best players, or I guess what, the number like three draft pick or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of, one of the top players. I think it was seven actually but someone that absolutely dominated at the college level. So you've got to think these guys are tough. They've played against good competition in the past, and hopefully we'll see that when they play this season. Yeah, especially Samir. He's coming in about as college-ready as I think you can be. Saw some great competition. The guy's supposed to have heart. I'm hoping he can replace Siakam in that regard. Also, in some of his interviews, Wade said that he's trying to be the spokesperson of the team trying to be tough, trying to be a leader. Another guy we're excited about who's coming in is Joe Toy. He has one of the nastiest high school tapes I've ever seen. It's pretty much just three or four minutes of him just dunking on people, putting them on posters. He's an athletic wing, about 6'7", 200, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's a guy who could probably play the small forward, might see some time at the 4'2", if we want to run small, space things out. And he's that athletic wing that we might have been missing last year. I think he's going to be the funnest player to watch on the team. Just imagine him running down the court, getting ready for some sick dunk. And we also have Damien, too. Like, we're going to have a lot of dunks. It's going to be a lot of fun to be watching these guys. Guys. My only question with Toy is whether he can defend well enough to, you know, occupy the starting small forward position. I think he could easily blossom into that. It's hard to tell right now. Yeah, right now I like Roberson in that spot still. Apparently he improved a lot over the summer. This is a team that has plenty of scorers. We'll get into that. You have Baldwin, started to score toward the end of the year. Fisher Davis, who has the, one of the nicest shots I've ever seen. One of the... Probably, Probably, I want. So, I, I don't want, want to say the nicest, but he has the smoothest shot right. I've ever if seen. If you gave me the option to pay ten dollars and just watch him shoot threes for an hour, I would probably take that offer. Like, yeah, it is so I fun agree. watching him shoot. The one problem is the shot may be a little bit slow, and that may factor into why it looks so nice. But wow, Fisher Davis has the most pure shot ever. Yeah, I, I think that uh, brings us to the last freshman, Cameron Justice. I heard Stalling say that Justice is the best pure shooter he has ever coached. This is considering we have Fisher Davis right now. LaChance. We had, yeah, we have LaChance right now with John Jenkins. Sean Foster. Shot, yeah. These guys are all unbelievable shooters. And we're hearing Cameron Justice might be the best of them. That's scary. I also 
read something extremely cool last night about Justice's high school career. I'll read it right now. The sharpshooter led Knott County Central to its fourth straight state tournament, averaging 24.2 points per game. He shot 54% from the floor, 43% from three, and 85% from the line. I mean, this is for a high schooler, 85% from the line. That's also, crazy. Yeah, he also finished his career with thirty or 3,587 points, which is third most in state history. He's number one in state history for free throws made with 843 and third in state history with 389. I mean, this guy is unbelievable. Yeah, I think he's the least hyped of all of our recruits, too. People like Toy, pure athleticism. Baptiste, I mean, just look at the guy. And then Sahik, probably replacing Siakam. But I think Justice is a guy. He could compete for some time in a crowded backcourt. You look at Wade, we think it's going to definitely be the point guard. But there's two or three, possibly four, two guards who could be very good. you got LaChance. you got Kressler, who we haven't even talked about yet. Fisher Davis, now Cameron Justice. These are all guys who can knock down the three. Most of them can score in space as well, off the dribble. Yeah, the major concern is whether we have too much depth. Unless Justice can be a combo guard, and this is something we've discussed a lot, maybe Justice or Lachance can play the point a little. We really need somebody to be able to do that. But assuming that he cannot, we have four amazing shooting guards, and it's really difficult to split time among them. I know sometimes they'll play point, sometimes they'll play small forward, just because we need to factor them in. But, I mean, Justice, we really think, has a ton of potential. It's just it's difficult to tell whether or not he's going to find the play time to show that. I think he could play point, too. He had six or seven assists a game in high That's school. That's true, yeah. And that would be good if he could play the point because two and even the three to some degree, very crowded spots. And that puts us into our last big addition, in my opinion, our biggest addition, Nolan, Nolan Kressler, Kressler yeah. transfer from Cornell. The dude put up 17 points a game his last year at Cornell. Part of that is because he was asked to do a ton, played 33 minutes a game, clearly the best player on the team. This is a guy who listened to Riley LaChance's interview last week. He seems excited about having him on board. Kevin Stallings also said we would have won some more games that we lost last year if Kressler was able to suit up. No, Riley and Kressler seem like best friends to me. I think their playing style is very similar. So my one question for you is whether you think that Kressler and Riley can coexist and both add a different dimension to the team. I think they can coexist. I think that we need to have Wade out there against a pressing defense. I think if there's not a pressing defense, it doesn't really matter. Our offense is so swing the ball around each way. Everybody's in different spots. We don't really need a true point guard out there once we get it up the floor. It might almost be better off if we had two guys who can score off the bounce. They're probably our two best pure scorers on the team. Lachance, pump fake, Drive to the elbow, pull up, knock it down. is supposed to be the same type of player. I'm hoping that Kressler's slightly better defensively than Riley just because he's bigger, inch taller. I think he has about 15 pounds on him too, 15, least, 20 pounds. Yeah. I think that they can coexist. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's just it's tough for me to tell now whether Kressler can be a huge impact player when he's asked to do less. I know uh, we found a cool stat earlier that his percentages were higher his freshman year when he played fewer minutes. And hopefully that's the case for us because there's no way he's going to be playing the minutes he played at Cornell. And it's very likely, at least at the beginning of the season, that he'll be coming off of the bench. So, I mean, you've got to wonder whether or not he can be someone that can come off the bench or even if he's not coming off the bench, play around 25 minutes. Uh, That sounds about realistic to me. And score over 10 points a game while touching the ball a lot less than he did at Cornell. If you look at the minutes from last year, Riley played 33 a game, Wade played 28 a game, Damian played 29 a game. Everybody else was under 25. I think it could be similar this year. I think Wade and Damian's minutes will stay the same, if not go up a little bit. Riley's might drop to around that 25 range, and I think everybody else, all the rotation players are going to play within 20 to 25 minutes of this uh, a game for this team, and that plays into our strength. Our strength is our depth, especially at the two guard and even up front. We have three seven-footers, another guy who's 6'10". I mean, we're not even talking about Josh Henderson. He's a guy who could come in, play five, ten minutes if we need him for defense. He's, what, going to be 24 years old at the end of the season? I don't know know how he's still around. He's an old grandpa, but we need that veteran on the team. Oh, definitely. 
He's yeah. good to have, or no seniors other than him, I guess, if he counts as a senior. And then a lot of these newcomers are the reason that Stalling scheduled harder games. He said in his press conference last week he always schedules to his team. And you look at it, we have a lot of big-time games early in the season, a little bit different than last year. Last year, our only really tough out-of-conference game was Baylor and then Purdue a little bit. But we're at Baylor, at Purdue, then later in the season at Texas. Those are three hard games. Those are three teams that will probably be ranked at the time we play them. Purdue's supposed to be around our level. Baylor borderline top 25 along with Texas. And in the Maui Invitational, we have, if we beat St. John's, which everybody thinks we will, we'll have Indiana, who's a top 20 team. And then if we were able to get past them, likely Kansas, that would be pretty cool to see. If we beat Indiana, even we just make it to the finals against Kansas and say we're undefeated up to that point in the season, we could jump to like a top 10 definitely top 15 team if we don't start there oh i believe Imagine. if we not if we beat kansas i think we'd be top eight if, easily, if we beat definitely. kansas yeah we'll probably be a top eight team that'd be crazy that'd be crazy definitely and i mean right after that we have a few big games that zach already mentioned what if we can go out of out of conference play with what do you say two losses i was gonna even? say one but kansas is a stretch so yeah two losses like going, two losses yeah. I'd, I'd be really confident going into conference play i mean kentucky is obviously the biggest in conference threat but we don't know exactly what to expect from them two seasons ago they struggled during the regular season it took them a while to truly find what type of team they were. And obviously they made it to the national championship in March Madness. So they were able to find their identity. But it took them a while, and that could be the case this year. But at the same time, it could be last year's team where they run the tables. Yeah, you don't have to be too much of an optimist to say that we'll at least split with them or at least have a good chance of splitting with them in the two games. Yeah, they're both Saturday games, too. We have one home, one away against them. That should be a ton of fun. I can't wait until Kentucky comes to campus. That's going to be arguably the funnest basketball game in our time at the school. Who knows? Oh, yeah. We also have two games against Texas A&M, and that's a very interesting one because assuming Kentucky gets first in the league, I think a lot of people would say it's a toss-up between us and A&M for who gets second, who gets third. And last year, a and M, I you'd have to give them the edge over us. They beat us one of the games by, I think, 12 or 13 points. And they return a ton and they also bring in, what is it, like the number six recruit in the yeah, country? Yeah, they have a really good recruit coming up. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's going to be a cool one. But although we say that A&M is maybe they are better last year and they bring in a lot this year, I'm still confident. I really think that we'll get second in the league, if not first. I think we definitely have a chance for first, second, or third. Very, very possible looking at this group. I think some possible lineups we could throw out there we want to talk about too. I really like Wade Baldwin. He really came into his own the second half of the year after Mitchell did started playing not as much. Wade became a leader for this team, especially for the guards. I like him. The opening day lineup, I think, will be Wade, Riley, Roberson, Luke, and Damian. Go with the returners. I like Roberson a lot more than some other people do because you need to have a guy who plays very good defense amongst all the scorers. The biggest question for our team is defense and rebounding. He's a guy you can rely on for that. That has to be the starting five unless Kressler somehow takes a two-guard spot. And the one reason he would have a chance of that is he was he wasn't playing in the games last year, but he's practicing with the team all season. So it's not like he's a true freshman. I mean, he's a junior. He has a lot of experience with the team. I could see him starting at the two guard, but chances are it'll be Lachance. Uh, no pun intended there. But in terms of Roberson, I completely agree. We have so many scorers on our team. We're going to score a lot. And we have so many three point shooters. We don't need another one on the court, especially at the beginning of the game. We need a tough guy that can play defense. And it's not like Roberson can't shoot either. The guy can score. If he has an open three, he'll hit it. And he has he, he's just a disciplined player who we've heard has improved a ton. Yeah, so the guy really the guy that. shot forty five percent from three last year. Granted, he only shot when he was wide open, but that's the highest percentage on the team. The guy can knock down shots. Well, the highest percentage on the team, except for James Siakam, who I believe yeah, went so. two of three. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm but sure that's a that small counts. sample size. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that counts. Yeah, but I think Roberson's someone that we can at least expect to start at the beginning of the season. It would be ideal if Toy could prove that he he can compete in the SEC that would mean against he's the good. best teams yeah. and steal that starting spot. Because offensively, there's no doubt in my mind that he could be better than Roberson. We saw Roberson miss a ton of layups last year. His offensive game was lacking. But if Toy can somehow take that spot, that would mean that he's good enough at defense to be, like, 
I guess, capable of replacing Roberson. And that, that would be the ideal situation. Beginning of the season, though, I don't see that happening unless he's unbelievable in practice. Oh, yeah, you got to go with the guy coming back. Roberson supposedly got a lot better over the summer, too. If he could develop an offensive game, he could be a very, very good player for us. I like Roberson's defense. I also like Wade's defense. It'd be interesting to see if Kressler is good at defense because I feel like that's Riley's worst area is his, because yeah, of his uh, because of his size mostly i mean the, the kid has heart it's just his size limits him against some of the quicker and bigger guards in the league yeah and i'm really excited about the big men too i mean damian and luke the two juniors are both listed at 7-1 now we actually think luke could be 7-2 at least with shoes on i mean I, I see the guys sitting at the big tables in new rand these tables when i sit in them my feet are like dangling there's like another three feet below them <laughs> Luke and Damon, their feet are like touching the ground. Yeah, it's, it's, so really, funny. it's really crazy. They're, they're so tall, and they've bulked up a ton, too. Uh, Damien's listed at 245 now, and Luke at 240. I know those aren't huge sizes, but that's a lot bigger than they were. And they're like, especially Damien, he's going to be able to assert his dominance this year. He's going to be the best big man in the conference for sure. And, I mean, all the NBA scouts are watching him. It could be a huge season for him. I hope so. It's tough in our offense to see him really putting up a lot more points than he is now. I think he could get up to 16, 17 a game. I don't know if we'd want him much above that. That'd mean he'd have to take a lot of shots. One easy area for him to improve his scoring is he only shot 60% from the line last year. If he gets that up to 70, he gets to the line so much that that would add on a couple more points a game, or at least another point a game, yeah. one more basket a game. There he is in that 17 range. I'd love to see him rebound more for somebody with his bounce and his size. He only had six and a half rebounds a game, which with Siakam gone, you really need that number to go up. Yeah, I think in general, the team's free throw percentage is going to go up a ton. We only shot 70% last year, which is really low considering that we're a shooting team. I mean, we mentioned Cameron Justice shot 85% in high school, but just looking at the players that return, they're all going to improve in their free throw percentages most likely, especially Fisher Davis. I mean, what did he shoot from the line last year? 71%. I mean, this we mentioned he has the most pure shot we've ever seen. I think his free throw percentage will probably go above eighty percent. Oh, that this has year. to go up. Yeah, we'd be nervous yeah. with anybody at the line besides Riley or Wade. We're hoping Kressler's good at the line. We're hoping that Fisher Davis improves. Even Roberson improves a little bit. If we just improved at free throw shooting, that could make a huge difference. I mean, one in nine last year in games that ended within five points, one in three in overtime. If we hit the free throws at the end of the game, something we really struggled to do last year, we could get five more wins easily. And that's assuming that we don't play better in the first, like, 38 minutes of the game if we just hit the free throws at the end of the game that could make the difference oh yeah and jimmy's talking about those 10 games a lot it might seem like a small deal but it's actually a really big deal if we just went five and five in those games we're probably a seven seed in the tournament yeah i mean we went 21 and 14 you add four wins that's 25 and nine yeah yeah 25 and nine that's we would probably be nationally ranked or just like just missing the cut be a seven or eight seed and you'd hope with all that we're adding this year, with everybody coming back, we'd be able to close out at least half of those games. And we're hoping a lot more than that. This team has very, very high ceiling. I think the floor is also pretty high. This is a team we fully expect to make the tournament. Where do you see them making? What, what seed do you think that they could get up to if they everything really think, panned out? Well, if everything pans out, I mean, we could be a one seed if no one gets injured. I mean, I have really high hopes for every individual on this team. I mean, we could be a one seed. That's pretty unrealistic. I'd say five or six, five to seven would be like the most realistic scenario. But I'm not, the ceiling is a one seed. We could really be like that good. I think a good way to judge it is Arkansas was, what, a four last year? Yeah. And they were ranked, they were, what, around 20 at the end of the year? Yeah, and they lost a lot of games, too. Clearly the second best team in the league, and I think we could be better than Arkansas was last year. What about you? We will, and I think Damian will be better than Portis was, possibly. And Portis carried that team. He really did. It was Bobby Portis. They did not have the depth that we have. In general, the SEC this year is going to be better. I don't think there's a team that was as good as we or A&M is going to be this year. And maybe even LSU. Yeah, LSU has so much talent coming in. Yeah, Ben Simmons, a top recruit. I mean, they they could be really good too. I don't have them quite as high as Vandy or A&M. But if we get the two seed, or if we're the second best in the SEC this year, 
could easily be a three or four seed. I'm saying five to seven is a nice, like, conservative way to think about it. Yeah. I wouldn't be disappointed whatsoever, but I really do think we could be better than that. So say we lose the two games out of conference that you think, call one of them Kansas, then say we lose either at Baylor or at Purdue. And then we have eight. That's two losses. Or Texas also. And then say we have two losses. We go through conference 14 and four, something around that. I think that would land us a three seed. seed. That could land us a three seed. Our strength of schedule is going to be a lot stronger this year. Yeah, no, we have, a, we have a really good strength of schedule. We've talked about this a lot, just uh, Zach and I in conversation. We have as hard of an SEC schedule as it really gets. I mean, our permanence for the two, like, home and away every year, we have Florida, we have Tennessee, who's not as good, but we also have Kentucky. I and mean, Florida and Kentucky, historically, are two of the best teams in the conference. And this year, we have Texas A&M twice. I mean, the only way our schedule could be any more difficult, at least like considering that we're in the SEC, is if we had LSU another time. Yeah, it's pretty much as hard as it gets. And then I, I kind of like, I would love to have home games, of course. I'd love to have Baylor and Purdue at home. That'd be really fun. I kind of like that they're on the road. If we dropped one or both of them, it hurts you a lot less than dropping them at home. Mm-hmm. Plus, if we were able to pull off the wind, it looks a lot better at being a road game. Oh, those are definitely quality wins when it gets to the tournament and you go to make your bracket on ESPN.com. It don't mention those games in either quality wins or quality losses. Those are huge ones, mm-hmm. assuming that we're as good as we think. And we those teams be. are, too. And, I mean, we've talked a lot about closing games. I mean, we're considering that we think we're going to be a lot better. A lot of these games we're not even going to have to close, it seems like. I hope so. I think it's like the Baylor game, the Texas game. A few of the big ones will be close, most likely. I mean, the first few games, we might win by 50 points. Yeah, That'll Austin P, like, we beat them 47-7 to seven in football. Will we win by more in basketball? If we actually try, if we keep Damien out for more than 15 minutes, I'm not yeah. sure if we will or won't. If we do, we'll probably win that by 50 points. Yeah. And uh, I actually kind of hope that we don't. It'll be a good opportunity for Baptiste to get some play time against one of the lesser opponents. And same with Justice, who is someone that we know is so talented, and it's a question as to whether he can, I guess, differentiate himself from Fisher Davis and other shooters on the team. So I think the game against Austin P. the first four games in general, or is it three games maybe? Yeah, first yeah. three. Stony Brook is decent. They make the tournament sometimes. but That's true, yeah. So, not I mean, on our level, but that should be decent. Yeah, first few games, though, in general, will be like a great opportunity for the young guys to play, and we'll get to see what they're all about. I kind of want to get into some rapid-fire questions now about stats. I think first one, points per game, who leads us? Damien with 16 or 17. I got Damien also, 17 a game. Three-point percentage. I'm going to go with Fisher Davis. His shot's just too pure. I could easily see him around 42%. I'm going to go with Cornette. He shot 40 last year, and it seemed actually a lot lower than that to me. Deceptively high, so I'm going to go with him. Every shot's uncontested for him. That's reasonable. That's that's, that's true. Free throw percentage. Free throw percentage. I'm going to say either Justice or Lachance. They'll both be around 85, I think. Yeah, I'm going to go with LeChance. Shot 87 last year. Could even get up to 90 this year. Steals per game. Steals per game. We have to go with Wade Baldwin. He averaged 1.4 last year. His minutes should be pretty consistent, and no one seemed to be too close in that category. Yeah, the only guy who was close was Siakam, actually. Wade was 1.4. The next guy after him and Siakam had 0.7 a game was LeChance, so I'm going to have to go with Wade, too. Assists per game. Also, Baldwin, 4.4 last year per game. He led all freshmen in the SEC for assists. I think this year he'll lead the conference in assists. I like that. That's bold. I'm going to go with Wade also. He could be close to that conference assist lead. Next one, an interesting one, maybe the toughest one. Who's going to lead us for rebounding? I'm taking Samir with this one. It's a bit questionable because we don't know how much he's going to play. But this guy can really box out. He models his game after Kevin Love. He plays plays with so much intensity. He's six foot nine. Plays very aggressive. I think he could average eight or nine a game if he plays over like twenty five minutes. I like that pick. I'm gonna go with Damian though. The guy's just so bouncy, so big. Put on mass. Hopefully his hands got a little bit stronger too. I'm going to go with Damian. I think he could rebound. I think he put up eight and a half or nine rebounds a game. That's maybe wishful I, I hope, thinking. I hope, I hope that's hope true. So. I do think Samir also, though. He's going to be a tough guy. 
seven or eight rebounds a game. Per, out of per minute, I think Samir will get Yeah, per minute, Samir, Damian probably going to play more than him, so that's a tough call. That's really the last true. one, who will be the X factor the for this X team? The X factor. I'm taking Joe Toy, the freshman. Small forward's a questionable position for us. We don't know exactly if Roberson's going to be able to maintain over 20 minutes a game for us. If Toy can be the starter at that position by the end of the season, we could be unbelievably exciting to watch and and a very lethal scoring team. I would love it to be Toy. I'm going to go with Cornette. As we said, the dude's 7-1, 7-2. Not many people in the whole world have his skill set, somebody that tall who can shoot. If he could just develop a couple of moves, take people off the dribble a little bit, I think he could be a guy to get us to the next level if he improves. Cornette could really be the X Factor for this team. I know I said Toy, but Cornette is definitely my second guy. If he can mold himself or transform, I should say, into half of what Kaminsky was his senior year, You'd love a junior year version of Kaminsky. We're going to be so hard to defend if this guy is playing half as well as Kaminsky. Our friend Dan just walked in. Where do you see this team finishing? What kind of seed do you think they could get? Uh, Well, as far as seed in the tournament, I feel like the top they could finish at was probably realistically a four or five seed. Bollocks. If we... uh, (laughs) What? Bollocks. We're better than that. Oh, I mean, I hope so. I mean, it's... I don't think it's out of our reach to finish higher than that, but I'd say that's realistic. If we reach okay. our potential, a 4 or 5 is realistic to expect. And within the conference, I'd say we're going to probably, hopefully, I, I'd, I'd consider the season kind of a loss if we don't finish in the top three in the conference. Yeah. Kentucky, I'd agree with that. Kentucky, yeah. you can't really feel bad about losing to, and LSU is supposed to be improved, and they were already a solid team last year. But besides those two teams, there's no other teams in the conference that you can really feel good if you don't. Yeah, them yeah. and yeah. A&M to some degree. It's pretty like, much it. Right. Yeah. I actually I like, like that, that prediction. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jimmy? If you had to put money on it, if somebody's like 100 bucks on it right now, where do we finish? What's our tournament seed? 100 bucks. I'd rather put 100 bucks on the battle round. Well, oh, yeah, where you have a 2-7 and seven record. <laughs> okay, jokes, jokes. Okay. I'm going to say the 4 seed. That would probably mean we're somewhere between 12 and 16 in the national rankings. <clears throat> Seems pretty realistic for me, 4. What about you? I want to say three. You want to say three? I, I want you to say three. Say three. I'll, I'll say three. I'm going to say three. I'm really optimistic about this team. Really excited. Maybe, maybe two. Maybe two. Maybe one. You never know. Yeah. Well, as, long, as long as we get in, you just got to get in, have a six seed or higher. Anything can happen. My main hope for the team is that we are ranked from day one to the last game of the season. Every single home game, we know we're ranked. Memorial Gym is jumping. That's my main hope, and I hope it's sold out. Oh, yeah, you look, we got it really should be. LSU over our winter break at home. Kind of disappointed about that, but the first week we come back, we got two games, Auburn and Alabama, two games we should win, two games we should dominate. We are excited about that. Almost all of the games are on ESPN or CBS, too. Yeah, everybody's we're, up we're on We're in this the team. spotlight. Definitely. It's an exciting time to be a Commodore basketball fan. We are hyped here. Dan, are you hyped? I am hyped. The campus is hyped. The city is hyped. It's time. It is time for Commodore basketball to emerge as a national power.